did. Let's get more on this now from Matthew Capucci, an atmospheric scientist. Matthew, thank you very much for your time outside the Rugby World Cup, possibly the Grand Prix. What impacts are you expecting from this? Well, Hagibius is an extremely impressive storm. It spent two bouts as a Category 5 hurricane equivalent, of course, it's Typhoon in the Pacific, but it rapidly intensified early Sunday night into Monday morning. In just 24 hours, it went from discussing an excess of 150 kilometers per hour, about 7 to 15 centimeters of rainfall, and a storm surge of 1 to 2 feet. There are other worries about Tokyo, I think, aren't there? It's a city of, what, 9 million people. Those high buildings, will they not funnel the winds? They could increase wind speeds. Very much so. That's one thing I'm really worried about. And we have to keep in mind, this is all within the eye wall of Hagibis, which is only about 80 kilometers wide right now. So if the track shifts just a little farther west or a little farther east, the eye wall could spare downtown Tokyo the worst of the impacts. But if it's going where it's forecast to right now, they could see the worst of it right in downtown. And like you said, the winds could have a funneling effect through those skyscrapers. In addition, you could have falling glass, you could have storm surge, all that stuff in the downtown area with 9 million people, a recipe for really bad news. And uh, just, Matthew, briefly, what factors are at play here? It does seem that with climate change in particular, we're seeing storms, the intensity of storms, increase much faster than it used to. Exactly. So we're seeing more storms undergo rapid intensification. Now, rapid intensification means it's increasing 55 kilometers per hour or more in 24 hours. This thing tripled that. So we're seeing more of that. So the storms we're seeing with climate change are not necessarily becoming more frequent, but the strongest storms will become even stronger thanks to the added moisture, thanks to the warmer waters, and of course, thanks to changing wind dynamics in the atmosphere as well. Matthew Capucci, thanks so much for your help on this. All right. For more on this, now we want to pull in the meteorologist who is following the storm with us, Matthew Capucci. He is watching everything from Washington, D.C. Good evening to you, Matthew. There's been a lot of talk about this, this predicted path cone of the hurricane and what it means and whether or not people are misunderstanding what the cone um, is supposed to represent. Talk to me a little bit about that. I mean, are people misreading what the meteorologists are predicting? I think the cone, people look at that and will say, okay, if I'm in the cone, danger. If I'm out of the cone, no danger at all. And in reality, the cone has nothing to do with how confident we are. You know, we look at that, we might think, oh, this is a range of possibilities. Instead, the cone is just based on historical error from the National Hurricane Center. So they look at all the paths over the last five years, how well their forecasts did, and then that's how they determine the width of the cone. So it really just shows different areas that the storm might go based on historical performance. But Dorian's been tougher to predict than most hurricanes. So don't take that cone too seriously. Take it with a grain of salt because Dorian is much more unpredictable than that. And, you know, I spoke with a climate scientist earlier today, and it, he said that, that um, Dorian represents the new norm for the Atlantic hurricane season, that because the Atlantic is warmer and also because you have more um, polar ice that's melting, that combination is fueling stronger storms. And he told me tonight, you know, you can expect at least one Dorian every season now. I mean, that's, that's, that's sobering news, right? Because there's no way really to, to make that not happen. To me, that sounds a little bit uh, extreme. What I will say is that storms are likely to become strong. So we have a couple of ingredients we're watching. You mentioned the warmer ocean waters. Hurricanes feed off this fuel, this warm ocean water to really get them going. So more of that will favor stronger hurricanes in the future. We're not seeing a trend for more hurricanes, but those that form will be stronger. In addition, you mentioned sea level rise. So now, if you have the ocean water rising, to, let's say, half a meter over the course of 50, 60 years, all of a sudden, it's a lot easier for coastal areas to flood with the same storms. So not only is the flooding and all the side effects getting worse, but we're also seeing the storms get worse. So there's that. In addition, for every degree Celsius we increase in temperature, the atmosphere can hold 7% more water. So when you have storms like Dorian Stahl, they have that much more rainwater to tap into, and you can get some extreme rainfall totals like we saw in 2017 with Harvey. So a multifaceted threat going forward, but the storm dynamics are really shifting, and climate change is part of the cost. All right. Well, we know that um, a lot of people, especially in the Caribbean, in the Bahamas, on the eastern seaboard of the United States, they're going to be watching to see if they're in that cone to see what this hurricane does for the next couple of days. All right, Matthew, it's good to have you on the show. We appreciate you taking the time to talk with us tonight. Thank you, Matthew.
as ever with extreme weather like this, we always now ask, is there a connection to climate change? Let's explore that issue. Matthew Capucci is an atmospheric scientist and meteorologist for the Washington Post, who's live with us. Thanks for your time, Matthew. Um, well, let me put that question to you. Is the nature of this storm connected to broader changes that are happening in our climate? So it's impossible to connect any one event with climate change. That said, this fits into an overall pattern that's a bit alarming. You know, for the past four years, we've seen Category 5 hurricanes in the Atlantic. That's never happened before. And so with climate change, we're not expecting to see more hurricanes, but those that form will likely be significantly more intense going forward. And I was mentioning earlier that Hurricane Dorian is not moving very quickly. Why is that? Correct. So right now there's kind of a battle in the atmosphere as to who picks up Dorian. There's a high pressure ridge off to the east, a low pressure off the west, and neither right now is connected with Dorian. So it's just sitting and spinning. It's like a game of tug of war, but no one's holding the rope. This thing can just sit and spin. It's been moving west at about two kilometers per hour, barely walking pace, in fact, less than walking pace. And so you have 300 kilometer per hour winds over some areas for an extended period of time. And as such, terrible news for the Bahamas, but perhaps better news for the U.S.? Correct. It's been got off in the Bahamas, almost like a tornado sitting there. And some areas have seen about a six to seven meter storm surge, which is incredible. In the United States, it's very tenuous as to how close Dorian will get. Right now, it looks like it'll say about 50 to 70 kilometers just off the coast where the eye wall will be. The eye wall is where the worst of the wind, the worst of the surge will be. And so it'll parallel the coast. That said, Florida will still see significant impacts. They'll get the wind, not quite as bad. They'll see about a one to two meter storm surge and plentiful rainfall of about five to 10 centimeters. And just help me get the context of this. How common or rare are Hurricane 5, Category 5 hurricanes? In the past century, we've had about, I want to say like 30 or so. So it's not terribly unusual to get a string of four in four years, actually more than four in four years, is quite noteworthy. So the Atlantic has been very active lately. And we see this every about 25 to 40 years or so, a flurry of activity. But that said, seeing one like this is quite impressive from a forecasting point of view. Matthew, we appreciate your help. Thank you very much indeed. Matthew, live with us from uh, the Washington Post, and you can read his analysis, of course, through the Washington Post website. Well so as you just mentioned, it's been downgraded to a Category 2. That might strike many people as saying it's not so much of a problem anymore. Could you lay out what's, what are some of the dangers that, that this storm still poses for people on the Atlantic coast? So one thing we have to remember when a hurricane starts to weaken, so to speak, is that it's not really weakening per se in terms of the size of the storm. In fact, when hurricanes, what are called spin down, even though their core of strong winds isn't quite as strong, the core actually expands. So now we're seeing this wind field broaden enough to encompass the coast, whereas before it wouldn't do that. So more areas along the immediate coastline of the United States are at risk for that wind. And the wind isn't even all that bad when you compare it to the coastal flooding. There are a lot of areas in Florida and the Carolinas that sit only perhaps half a meter to a meter above sea level. And when you're talking a one to two meter storm surge, that could put some coastal areas underwater during the high tides in the next few days. And this hurricane has been said to have been one of the most powerful on record. What does it tell us about this year's Atlantic hurricane season? So Atlantic hurricane season right now has actually been off to a slow start prior to Dorian. We're only in the Ds in terms of the names, which are alphabetical. And normally we'd be pretty much towards like F, G, H right now. So it was a slow start. That said, we're moving towards a climatological peak of hurricane season when the waters are the warmest, the hurricanes are really getting going. And I think these stronger storms could be a trend alluding to a future more peppered with these severe storms thanks to climate change.